A new poll has bad news for Ohio Republicans, and Richard Cordray gets a Washington promotion. From the Battelle studio at WOSU at COSI, this is Columbus on the Record. Joining Mike Thompson this week, Bill Cohen, State House Correspondent for Ohio Public Radio, Reginald Fields, Columbus Bureau Chief for the Cleveland Plain Dealer, Michael Daniels, co publisher of Outlook Media, and Michael Miller, attorney and former Franklin County prosecutor. After losing his bid for re election as Ohio Attorney General, Richard Cordray has landed squarely on his feet. President Obama this week introduced Cordray as his nominee to head the new Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Cordray was already serving as the agency's director of enforcement, but he was picked for the spot when the bureau's brainchild, Elizabeth Warren, drew fierce Republican opposition. I am proud to nominate uh, Richard Cordray uh, to this post. And we've been recently reminded uh, why this job is going to be so important. There is an army of lobbyists and lawyers right now working to water down the protections and the reforms that we passed. We're not going to let that happen. While Attorney General Cordray drew national attention for taking on lenders for unscrupulous practices that helped lead to the foreclosure crisis, and of course, any introduction of Cordray is not complete unless you bring out the old video of him winning on Jeopardy. Uh, That's why all his confirmation, uh, all his answers at his confirmation hearings will be in the form of a question. (laughs) That's a joke. (laughs) All jokes aside, uh, he was, Reggie Fields, he was the logical choice after they didn't want to go with Elizabeth Warren, given his track record here in in Ohio. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, he was only attorney general for two years, but prior to that, he was a state treasurer also. So he has some experience, uh, you know, dealing with the uh, the banking industry in that that regard as well. But in just the two years as as attorney general, I mean, he really did kind of you know, uh, bring about sort of a national uh, presence uh, for taking on banks, for addressing issues uh, such as uh, predatory lending practices amongst the banks and and mortgage uh, fraud and different issues like that. So uh, I think this is sort of a a tailor-made job for him. The question is whether or not, you know, he's going to get it or how he's going to get it, uh, because the Republicans obviously in Washington, uh, they weren't in favor of Elizabeth Warren, and they're not so much against Cordray, but they just don't like the idea of this agency in itself period. So, Yeah, the Republicans claim that the agency is too independent. There's not enough checks and balances on, on the part of the congressional oversight and that kind of thing. But uh, the supporters say that's what they should be like, should be, should be free from all that stuff. Yeah, the House, I, I understand, has passed a bill that, that uh, uh, you know, puts brakes on this new agency uh, with Republican votes, of course. But over in the Senate, the Democrats rule, so uh, it's not likely that that bill is going to pass. And the, I mean, the president has already said that he's going to veto anything. So, I mean, the House passes it. It's more or less symbolic. To, I mean, the president will never, never go for it. Uh, but I think ultimately what's going to happen is, is the president is probably going to have to use what, what's known as a, a recess appointment, mm-hmm. where he's going to have to wait until the Senate goes on vacation for the rest of the summer and then sort of appoint him uh, uh, Richard Cordray in that way. And of course, it's temporary, but it will at least allow him to be able to serve through the remainder of, of the president's current term. And that re- would return him to Ohio in December of 2012, which is about <laughs> the time that, you know, he might be thinking about running for governor. Michael Miller, does this make him a more formidable candidate? to take on John Kasich or whoever the Republican nominee might be. Well, I think uh, Richard's a formidable candidate with or without this position. He's a guy that, uh, as the Attorney General has said, uh, Mike DeWine, uh, uh, people like him, and indeed they do. I mean, uh, there are some really good people in politics, and I think he's one of them. Uh, He's highly qualified and so forth. And as I said here, I think six months ago or so when we were on, and I was on, and I said I thought he would be the Democrat candidate for governor in uh, 2012, and I think he's still still will be. Can I, can I, I have the wrong I, year. Right? I used to think that being attorney general and being a consumer advocate really helped you run and win elections. But obviously it didn't work for Cordray last time. It didn't work for former attorneys general Betty Montgomery and, and Lee Fisher. They, they were strong consumer advocates. It didn't even work for the guy who changed the attorney general's job into that of consumer advocate in the 1970s, Bill Brown. I thought he was going places. He couldn't even win the governor's primary, the primary in 1982. So uh, this idea that uh, that's a great you know, consumer advocate is a great populist thing to run, run on 
may not be as strong as, as it appears. And I think it's really going to depend on what happens in the presidential and congressional elections in 12 as well, in 2012 as well, because if, <clears throat> as, as I expect, Obama's return to the White House, it may very well be that Cordray stays on, in, as you said, as Reggie said, uh, do some sort of a, a, of a recess appointment, but then if he stays on, I can guarantee you one of the people who's lobbying the hardest for Rich Cordray to get confirmed is Congressman Tim Ryan. Because I think that that clears the way for, for Ryan to be the gubernatorial candidate for the Democrats in, in 2014. Rob Portman, might he vote to confirm uh, Richard Cordray, the Republican senator from Ohio, if, if the vote came up? I don't think there's much question that, that we could expect Senator Portman to support a Cordray appointment. I think the question is going to be whether he's going to join in the filibuster with the Republicans in the Senate to keep the agency from being created. Yeah. Well, um, but Senator Portman is among the Republicans who signed on saying that they would not confirm anyone to this position unless there were changes made to the agency itself. And so he was one of the, I, I think it was maybe 40, 44 uh, Republicans in the, in the um, General Assembly uh, there in Washington who signed on. So I don't, I don't know if it's a slam dunk that he will you know, sign on. So even though as a hometown guy, he still has philosophical opposition. Mm -hmm. To this, to this agency. But to the, I think I think Reggie's right, but I think it's to the agency. I don't think it's yeah. to Rich Cordray. I've known Rich Cordray for a long time, and I don't I don't know anybody who doesn't like Rich Cordray and doesn't respect his his abilities. Okay. All right, our next topic. Since winning election, John Kasich's approval rating has sunk. We were wondering if this no new taxes budget would give him a boost in the polls, but a new poll shows just the opposite. A Quinnipiac University poll shows that Kasich's approval rating has actually fallen since May. It's down to 35 percent. Kasich's support for Senate Bill 5 is probably not helping. That same poll shows that 53 percent of Ohioans oppose the limits on public employee union collective bargaining. And if the repeal vote were held today, it would pass in a landslide, 56 to 32 percent. Bill Cohen, the repeal will be on the ballot. No surprise there. But as of right now, are you surprised by the margin by which it would lose? The margin on collective bargaining? Yeah, on, on, by, by Kasich's approval rating and the collective bargaining. Well, I was a little surprised that Kasich's approval rating didn't come up a little bit because I figured it, w it couldn't go any lower <laughs> than it was a couple months ago. And he'd you know, made a big deal about forging that deal with the casinos, bringing in extra cash, he said. So I thought maybe he was going to bottom out and come up. But instead, his disapproval rating is even, even worse. Uh, I'm not real surprised by the collective bargaining uh, margin right now. That margin has actually grown a little bit since the May uh, poll. Before, it was, uh, there was an 18 percent gap between those who wanted to repeal it and those who wanted to keep it. Now that gap is 24 percent. So if anything, the momentum is on the side of the unions. And the numbers are almost identical when you look at his approval rating and, uh, and support for Senate Bill 5. It's, many have said this will be a referendum on John Kasich. The numbers seem to bear that out. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. Um, you know, it's got to be disappointing for the governor. He'll never, he always says that he doesn't pay attention to the polls, but he would if the polls were in his favor. And so it's got to be disappointing for him um, that, that this is where it is because he took office with, with a couple of, you know, communications and public relations blunders that immediately got him off on a wrong foot with a lot of people who were or in the polling. But in recent months, he's actually got a lot of his agenda across, um, especially the state budget, um, Jobs Ohio. Uh, these are all things that were part of his agenda that he ran on, said I would do once I got in an office. And yet still here we find that his approval numbers, as, as Bill says, you know, aren't going better. They actually got worse. But I, I think there's there's two pieces to that. I think the fact that he he has been very successful at doing exactly what he said he would do during the campaign, which has done nothing more than to solidify the 49 percent of voters who already didn't like him coming out of the campaign. I mean, he squeaked by the election. So he had a whole group of people who didn't like him and getting all these things passed quickly didn't help that any. And the other thing is because of the the public relations blunders, he just doesn't come across as a very likable guy. Now, I, don't, I don't know the governor. I can't tell you if he is a likable guy or not. But even if you are supportive of his policies, if you watch this guy on TV, he's very easy to not like. He just comes across as being very brash and very arrogant and very, I'm the governor and I'm going to do what I want and I really don't care to listen to anything you all have to say. And I think that even rubs people who may agree with his policies the wrong way. And we know that approval ratings are as much about how someone perceives, it's, it's, it's as much a personality competition as it is a policy competition. Well, also remember uh, when, the, when the race was going on and, and we had the, I think what it ended up projected, $8 billion shortfall or so forth, 
And the candidates, including the governor and the former governor, nobody told us what they were going to do. Nobody told us. And we all knew why they didn't tell us, because you're going to irritate a lot of people. If you're cut, you're cut, you're cut. Well, now, as Michael says, he's done what he said he did. He balanced the budget or, or came out with it without the raising the taxes. And, indeed, this group's hurt, this group's hurt, this group's hurt. And they're reacting, and they're, he's going to take it out on him at the polls. And I think it's to be expected. I think those numbers will come up as time goes by. Uh, but uh, it's nothing surprising to me because we're in a situation now where people are uh, are getting hurt from uh, these cutbacks, and, and they're not going to like it. It's like... You know, you can do it to everybody else, but don't do it to me. When it happens to me, you, they're angry. Senate Bill 5 supporters claim the more people know about this bill, and as the education process, they call it, as that continues, that more and more people will come to their side and will see the merits of, of curtailing collective bargaining. But as Bill said, the opposition has been pretty solid. If not, it has, it's grown a bit. It, does this have any hope of succeeding in a repeal election, Senate Bill 5? Uh, no. I, I predicted when Senate Bill 5 passed that, that they'd get four times as many signatures as they needed to repeal it and that it would go down two to one. Um, and the numbers are trending my way. So I think that I still think it's going to get I think still think it's going to get beat at least 60, 40. Michael, do, is there any hope from well, the Well, I, I think side? it depends on uh, I would have to say at this point in time that it's that that it is going to uh, be uh, reversed and uh, repealed. But on the other hand, I think if they come up with the money, uh, those people in front of it and get a message out, I think they've got a message to get out too that will, uh, a lot of people will like to hear. So I think it will certainly come down closer. I don't see it as two to one, but maybe Michael's white. But uh, there's a long time left. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's only July. We'll, we'll see. Right. I mean, there's, there's, there's always hope for it, uh, but you know, you got to consider what Governor Kasich maybe pulled, what, 1.8, 1.9 million votes or something like that to be elected governor. This is an off-year uh, sort of referendum issue. It's not going to need nearly that many votes to, to pass. And what was confirmed was over 900,000 signatures confirmed just to get it on the ballot. I mean, if, if those people vote and just half bring of them bring a friend, yeah. I think it's, it, yeah. it'll be in there for uh, sure. If it does get wiped out, the entire law, don't count out the idea that Republicans could come back and enact some of the provisions that the, the polls show voters like. Voters like, by comfortable margins, the idea of replacing longevity with merit when it comes to pay hikes. They like requiring workers to pay at least 15 percent of their health care premiums. They like at least 10 percent of the wages going for pensions from these workers. So mm -hmm. I think the Republicans could come back and get half a loaf. It, this just shows they, they may have overreached. Yeah. Looking ahead to 2012, the same set of poll numbers this week show that the U.S. Senate race that uh, Democrat incumbent Sherrod Brown held holds fairly comfortable leads over his two uh, Republic, uh, potential Republican opponents, Josh Mandel and Kevin Coughlin, both 34, 32 percent to Brown's roughly 49 percent. Um, name recognition is a, is a problem here, do you think, or is it just that Sherrod Brown is, is in decent shape? I, I think Sherrod's in pretty good shape. I mean, I think that voters of Ohio have always liked to send sort of one liberal and one conservative to the Senate. You don't have to look back past Howard Metzenbaum to see that. Um, but Sherrod is, Sherrod's a populist. Sherrod plays very, very well, and people tend to respect him and, and to like him. Um, and I think that, I think he's sitting in really good shape right now. I don't think that there's going to be much of a challenge. Josh Mandel, who's the front runner for the nomination on the GOP side, Michael, he's going to, he has raised a lot of money. He's going to spend a lot of money. He's going to have a lot of ads out there running. He, he still could challenge the incumbent senator. Well, I, I sure he could challenge him, and I, I think a lot of it's going to be beyond uh, uh, either one of them because uh, what's the economy going to be? Now, if, we, if we stabilize and things are you know, fine, and I think the president's going to be reelected, and, and that means you know this. If we uh, continue or if we start down again and unemployment crimes to 10, 11 percent, it's going to change everything. Right. And any incumbent uh, senator, uh, congressman, whether Republican or Democrat, is going to have problems. So I, I think it's we've got to wait and see what the economy does. And yeah, there's I a warning agree. sign right now on the economy because just uh, this week the new unemployment rate for Ohio came out. It went up two-tenths of a point, not a lot, but it's the first time in almost two years it's gone up. So a lot of people are worried it's going to be heading back yes. upward. Yeah, I was just going to agree with Mike. I mean, I think it's going to come down really to where is the economy next year when people go to, to actually vote. I, I think Sherrod Brown's in pretty good um, position right now, but if that if the economy continues to be where it is or, or, or get worse, then, you know, it could be a referendum on, you know, whoever is in office on that ballot, whoever's an incumbent and, at that and, time. And how, and how the voters interpret that incumbency, whether it be a referendum on Obama, which hurts Brown, 
or whether it becomes a referendum on the first two years of the Kasich administration, which hurts all the statewide Republicans. So, uh, Speaking uh, of the president, President Obama was on this poll at uh, run by Quinnipiac University, and he does okay against uh, all of his potential Republican opponents. He, he faced the closest challenge, according to this poll, by Mitt Romney, a four-point spread there, but he beats Rick Perry the, uh, from Texas, Michelle Bachman from uh, Minnesota, and Sarah Palin by healthy margins. And this, even though the same poll shows that roughly two-thirds of Ohioans believe that Ohio, they are dissatisfied with the direction that Ohio is going. So there's that contradiction. They're not happy with the economy, but he's still... President Obama is still leading in the polls. Well, the, the truth of the matter is that the Republican presidential field right now looks like a fairly a group of juvenile clown trainees trying to all get into the same car at the same time. I don't think it's too hard to come out on top. I think I could probably run against the Republican field right now and come out on top in a Quinnipiac poll. I think the Republicans are going to have to sort themselves out and see where the legitimate candidates come out and where the where the non-legitimate candidates come out and then we'll have to take a look at a poll maybe a year from now or so when when we're, when president obama is facing what i think is going to be potentially a legitimate challenger michael mitt romney saw this poll maybe and he's rushing to Pataskala next week he's going to be in ohio next uh, next week uh, he's the favorite among ohio republicans so uh, not surprisingly he wants to take advantage of that well he does but again when you're talking presidential politics uh, what are we from the election now? Uh, about a year and a half, yeah. something. Where was uh, Barack Obama? Who? Uh, a, a year and a half before. Where was Bill Clinton? Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's so many people. So many things can change. Uh, yeah. If the election's today, absolutely. Yeah. But 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 it's not. Yeah. All right. Our next topic. The poll shows that most Ohio Republicans like John Kasich. But reportedly, the governor and top party leaders are squabbling. Kasich annoyed Republican lawmakers by vetoing a bill that would have allowed businesses to siphon unchecked up to 5 million gallons of water from Lake Erie. And the dispatch reports that Kasich will snub this weekend's annual GOP dinner because of what the Kasich administration calls scheduling conflicts. Mike Miller, it shouldn't be surprising that John Kasich annoys folks, even his own, in his own party. Um, the top brass and him fighting is that a surprise? Well, not really. I think I think he's pretty he's pretty independent, and, and historically, uh, this seems to have happened. Apparently, uh, even in my time, uh, Governor Rhodes did it twice. Came in and wanted to name his own chairman, which uh, allegedly is what uh, the governor did. With uh, wanted to remove Kevin DeWine. Correct when he came in, and apparently uh, George Voinovich uh, did the same thing. Reggie, I'm sure knows about that. And uh, so, uh, what uh, the governor is trying to do, I guess, is not. Uh, uh, particularly new, and it, it obviously creates some problems. And uh, he doesn't back away from any problems, whether he should or not. I don't know. That's for somebody <laughs> else to say. But I, I guess I'm really not surprised by the whole thing. Is there a split in the Republican Party here, or is this just inside the Capitol Square talk? I, I don't know. But the, the, the split here between Kasich and and the, the party leaders, however, is not anything new. I mean, this was pretty apparent even during the campaign, even before John Kasich became a candidate, uh, just because he put himself out there as a candidate before the Republican Party had a chance to really sort of vet out all of the folks who they wanted to run. And even during a campaign, uh, uh, many of us will, will remember, John Kasich would throw out <coughs> terms like the Republican Party is my vehicle, never my master. And you know, you would not see very many uh, Republican Party heads, such as Kevin DeWine or anyone at many of his events on the campaign trail or anything like that. So it was pretty obvious, even that far back, that there was a little bit of a difference here, you know, between He's the two. He's never been afraid to criticize the Republican Party or mainstream Republicans like Voinovich and Taft. He criticized them for allowing tax hikes to take effect. So he's always put, uh, uh, I think, conservative values ahead of the party. I, yeah, this doesn't this doesn't surprise me, and it goes back simply to the he wanted to put in his own chairman, and and then that didn't happen, and that's nothing new. But rifts at the top of the leadership are also nothing new. I mean, the, the, there's the obvious rift between Senate President Niehaus and Senator Seitz, um, and the uh, you're not going to vote my way, Bill. I'm going to replace you on this committee, and oh well, I'm not going to live with you anymore, and all this other kind of stuff. So uh, when that's the problem, as Bill and I were talking about before the show. When you're in the minority, you can kind of be vocal and scream, and you can all kind of stand together and do that. But when you're in the majority, you actually have to govern, and that's when people's really strong opinions start to come out and people start to bump heads. Is it a bad thing to have this, these little squabbles? I mean, there's a criticism that the Republican Party, particularly in Washington, is in lockstep. They're very, they, won't, they won't waver. They won't compromise. Here you have competing forces in, within a party. They might 
force a more reasonable approach to certain things. Well, I, I'm loving it either yeah. direction. Either yeah. they force themselves to become reasonable or they fracture and my party wins in two years. So I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. But does it necessarily have to be a fracture if the, five, if the folks disagree? No, I don't think it has to be a fracture. I, 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 don't, I don't think it's... Uh, it, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be troubling for Republicans. I, in a way, it's healthy. I, you know, a, a little bump once in a while on the road, I think it's good for everybody. I, I love competitive primaries where they really <laughs> yell at each other. I mean, it's, it's great sport. I mean, anyway. A conservative activist, James O'Keefe's undercover cameras have focused on a Franklin County worker, and it's not a flattering picture. Two men posed as Russian mobsters and told a Medicaid benefits pre-screener that they sold illegal drugs forced their 12-year-old sister, sister into prostitution and wanted to find a way to qualify for Medicaid benefits even though they owned an $800,000 sports car. And if it's not something registered here, maybe I just wouldn't mention it. Right? Yeah, that's what I'm Not that I can say that. <laughs> you didn't hear right, that from me. Right, right, right. <laughs> but, because that would, right there, that would throw him okay. off. But he, he would be immediately mm, not qualified. You've got a lot to help. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> you better work all that out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even, look, like, I, no, 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 I don't hear. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Whenever you see someone la, 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 la on camera, Michael, that's not a good sign. Despite what it, whatever you think of his tactics, what, what does this video tell you? Oops. Um, first, it tells me that her name is Daniel, so is mine, and we're not related. I just want to get that okay. on camera. Um, it, th that's just one of those what are you thinking moments. I mean, it's one of those. I, I see this, and you ha you think this has to be staged. This cannot possibly be real. We can actually not possibly have people who work for the state who are saying, okay, these are all the things that will keep you from qualifying. Please don't mention them. Now, did she think this was a joke? I doubt it. Um, I, I'm completely speechless by this. This is one of those just what, what, what kind of moments? Is it, is it fraud? Is it trying to be too nice? Is it a lack of training? Is it ignorance? Is it well, all the, L the above? Yeah, I would say at the very least is a, a lack of training or just, you know, incompetence in your job. So, uh, and I believe uh, we have now heard that I believe jo Job and Family Services is going to force some retraining yeah. of employees, but not just those in a the camera there, but I guess in all 88 counties. But I think at the very least is absolutely incompetence in job. Uh, but isn't there a point at which that <clears throat> ret you shouldn't have to be retrained to tell two groups of mobsters in an $800,000 car who forced their 12-year-old <laughs> sister into prostitution that they might not be eligible for benefits? Right. <laughs> it reminded me of the Borat movie. I mean, especially yeah. with the uh, because there was some humor in it, uh, although it's a very serious matter here. And you got the Russian accents, and uh, it just uh, now we have to assume they weren't we wearing those getups when they went inside. Uh, hopefully, they weren't wearing the glasses and the whatever they were wearing in the video. They just looked normal, but you never know. <laughs> um, <laughs> do, does it have? I mean, th these folks didn't get money, didn't get past the pre-screener. They never actually applied for the benefits. They just it was an entrapment video. Um, so the answer, you don't, Michael, you don't know two things, and you, you being a former prosecutor is, how many other times do workers overlook these possible uh, disqualifiers for benefits? And also the other one is, how many times did he go into a Medicaid office and they said, get the heck out, we're not going to deal with you? Yeah, you don't know those things. And, uh, but, I, you know, we're all on stage anymore. We're all open. Uh, everything's changed. When I was in, years, a million years ago, when I was in the FBI, I had one time, I had a little camera under my shirt and my tie clasp was a lens and I would squeeze a <laughs> squeeze a rubber thing in my pants to take a picture and I thought it was really high tech <laughs> 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 and, and you see what's going on now and I, I think you could replicate that mm -hmm. almost anywhere in the country not only government mm -hmm. private enterprise all kind of stuff you give somebody with a camera and surreptitiously go on and everybody looks foolish uh, it's it's just too bad but it's it's reality and uh, uh, you know I suspect uh, the other side could do it too I know he he espouses conservative uh, issues, but I, I think that a liberal progressive could do the same thing on the other side. It's, it's going to happen, make everybody look idiotic. All right, <laughs> let's get to our final off the record parting shots. Michael Miller, we'll let you go first. Uh, my parting shot prediction what have you, when I get out of here, I'm going to go someplace where there's water and ice and uh, try and get through this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with that. Michael. Um, my prediction is that 61 days from today when Don't Ask, Don't Tell has gone the way of the dodo, the sun will still come up, the United States military will still be the most prepared military in the world, and in fact will be better off for having repealed the policy. Okay. Reggie. Uh, I think we're going to see uh, Governor Kasich continue to move forward despite 
polling numbers and everything else. And he's going to keep on with his agenda. And, and uh, I think we'll see him try to sell off the, the turnpike next. Mm -hmm. We'll see something real soon on that. Okay. And Bill? In late September, the new Ohio law takes effect, allowing people with permits to carry concealed weapons to bring them into bars. But look for most bars to to still keep them out because there's a provision in the law that says you can post a sign saying I still don't want guns in here and we've talked to some of the bar owners and most of them say they're going to take advantage of that provision. And speaking of bars, the State House has avoided the controversy over the bar in the State House by renaming it. It's now known as the lunch counter. So I, who wants a, I want a bar in my basement, but my wife is reluctant to approve that plan. I'm going to just tell her now that it is not a bar, it's a lunch counter, and we'll both be happy. So I thank the State House and Capitol Square for that. That is Columbus on the Record for this week. Please check us out online. We are on Facebook and on Twitter, and you can connect to all of that and see video of all of our past shows at our website, wosu.org slash cotr. For our crew and for our panel here at WOSU at COSITE, I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week.